This is one of the exam papers from one of the hardest maths courses in the world. And last year, I had to sit a fair few of these. Hi everyone, my name is Ellie, and last year I studied part three of the Mathematical Tripos at the University of Cambridge, and I had one of the best times, learned some incredible maths, and today I thought I'd switch up the video and show you what an exam looks like on this course. So I've made a full video going into all the detail about part three maths. There are loads of videos on my channel just talking about the course itself and what you can expect and stuff like that. So if you're interested in the course, lots of videos on my channel talking about that. But today I'm gonna to be diving into uh, an exam paper Paper and just showing you the solutions for an exam paper, showing you what the exam looks like and also giving you some solutions as well. So I have chosen a module known as Dynamics of Astrophysical Discs and this was a module that I studied last year and it was one of my favourites. I really, really enjoyed it. I have chosen this module specifically because it has a mix between astrophysics and mathematics and also the course itself I thought was probably one of the easier courses, wasn't quite as in-depth as fluid dynamics, um, which was quite intense. Continuum mechanics was, was quite intense. But this paper itself I thought was quite a nice paper, which is why I've answered the questions and I'll be showing you the solutions. And yeah, hopefully it's quite easy for those of you that haven't studied the course content to follow along and also give you a bit of an idea of what an exam paper can look like at the University of Cambridge. Let's get stuck in and I'll show you the solutions now. Okay, so you are on my iPad here, just so it's a bit easier to kind of comment on things and move between pages. So this is the paper here. Uh, this is the full paper. First of all, I guess the main thing, this is the University of Cambridge's. It is the Mathematical Tripos. That line was not very straight, but there we go. It's a Mathematical Tripos, and it's also known as part three. Again, I've explained all of this in another video, so if you're interested, check that out. This paper is from 2019. It is one of the nicest papers out of the set, I would say, um, which is why I kind of, I took a bit of time looking through all of the past papers to check I could find one that was, that the solutions were nice enough that I could, that I could explain in a way that wouldn't confuse you too much. Um, I didn't want to get a too complicated exam. Um, and then you be not following along at all. So <laughs> I've gone for the 2019 paper. The module is Dynamics of Astrophysical Discs, and that is one of my was one of my favourite modules at the University of Cambridge when I studied this course. So some, I guess, logistics of the paper itself. You can't answer more than two questions, and there are a total of three questions altogether. So essentially this exam was a two unit course. The modules at Cambridge are made up of two unit or three unit courses. And this one was a two unit course, which is why you answer only two questions out of three. If it's a three unit course, you would answer three out of four questions. And also the reason I chose this was because this was the only two unit course I did. And I thought it'd be a bit easier to go through three questions rather than four. So <laughs> that's also another reason. Uh, and I guess the final thing is the questions carry equal weight. So you aren't gonna get more marks for answering one question than another, unless obviously you answer them, if you get it wrong on one and not on the other, but you understand what I mean. So yeah, this is the exam. These are the things that you're allowed. Um, and this is literally just the cover sheet and treasury tag are basically just the cover sheet for your exam. Um, the tag is like a tag to link the pages that you've written on together. The script paper is to write on and the rough paper is just to make rough notes. And yeah, you can't start until the invigilator says so. So that is the front page. Now what I'm going to do is move on to the exam itself. So this entire question here, all, all of this, these, these two pages, 1A, 1B and 1C, that is all one question. And I've just forgot to mention, does it tell you how long? Yeah. So it's a two hour exam. Two hours for two units and three hours for three unit exams. So all of this here, you had to do in one hour, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and again, all of this was, I think that's just question two. Yeah, it is. that's all of question two. And that's all of question three. Uh, and each of these you have to do within one hour. So what I'm gonna do is instead of trying to fit the notes in between the margins here. I have actually done it separately, separated each of the questions, uh, and then we're just gonna go through each of them like that. So yeah, um, the first question uh, is 1A, and it says, accretion onto a black hole of mass M is sometimes modeled using New Newtonian physics in the gravitational potential. So we're given this gravitational potential here. And it has this formula here, where R, phi, and Z are cylindrical polar coordinates R sub subscript G equals GM over C squared, and that is the gravitational radius. 
So these are kind of just explaining what each of the values in here mean. So it says calculate the orbital frequency. So we have one here. Specific, in fact, I'll note, note that. So we've got one. Orbital frequency, specific, specific angular momentum, two. Specific energy, three. Orbital shear parameter, four. And epicyclic frequency, so five. Of circular orbits of radius r greater than 2rg in this potential. Deduce that these orbits are unstable. So, okay, so the first, so the first part is essentially just this part, which is calculating these five quantities. So in dynamics of astrophysical disks, we have certain formulas for each of these. So the first thing that we want to know, uh, and this is just to essentially simplify all of these, because what you'll notice is all of these are dependent on just r. And when you look at this phi here, you'll notice that it also depends on z. Now, something to know in a black hole and in kind of like an accretion disk, uh, typically we have z is much much less than the radius and that's just because it's essentially a thin a thin disk so with that approximation you can reduce the gravitational potential to this value here so it reduces to that so now what we can do with that is given the gravitational uh, potential we can start calculating this orbital frequency specific angular momentum and all the quantities that we need so this is number one so orbital frequency that is essentially just given by this formula here. And what I'll do is, because I've already highlighted things in red for the final answer, I'll comment them in blue just so you know which, which I'm writing and, and which are just the final answer. So the orbital frequency is given by this equation here. So what you can do is essentially do differentiate this here with respect to r, uh, and then divide by r, square root it, and essentially you get your orbital frequency, which is given by this here. Okay. Now, again, you can do the same for specific angular momentum. That is literally just multiplying the orbital frequency by r squared. Uh, and again, you can calculate that. Now, I'm obviously not going to go into too much detail on why each of these things uh, are given by the equations they're given. I'm literally just trying to get through as, as much of this exam as I can in you know as much little time as possible. So if you are interested in maybe the underlying maths and why certain equations are the way they are, just let me know and, and I'll make a video on it. So yeah. Um, yeah, so we've done specific angular momentum, so that was number two. Specific energy, which is number three. Uh, that's given by this formula here. And again, we already know what um, omega squared is, which is the orbital frequency. You can just plug that into there, add the gravitational potential, and then we get what the specific energy is here. And then the fourth quantity that it wanted was the orbital, sh orbital shear parameter. Now, this is given by Q. This, again, depends on R. It's given by this formula here. And again, we can just input what the orbital frequency was into here and obtain a value for Q of R. And that's this here. And then the final one was the epicyclic frequency. And the epicyclic, fre epicyclic frequency depends on Q, which is what we've just previously calculated in number four. And the orbital frequency, which is what we calculated in number one. Uh, again, a bit of manipulation and, and just simple... I guess cal calculating there and you get this final one here which is the epicyclic frequency so that's this here okay so the first part of that question was was all right you know we are literally just given a potential in terms of the exam you just have to remember the equations for the orbital frequency specific angular momentum specific energy stuff like that um so that in itself is is quite a nice first part of the question now the second part says Deduce that these orbits are unstable for R is less than R in, where R in is 6RG. Okay, and then we'll get to the next bit. So, typically, so this is this part here. Typically, uh, this is something that we learned in our module. Orbits themselves are unstable when you have the, the epicyclic frequency is less than zero. So essentially, all you need to do is just look at this quantity here. And then say, okay, when is that less than zero? And we can look at the denominator and then the numerator. We know already that r is greater than 2rg, which is, it was given in the equation, uh, the formula, the, sorry, the exam question here. 
So we already know that R is greater than 2RG, so for that we can then say, okay, well this bottom one is always going to be positive, but obviously this here will be negative when R is less than 6RG, and that's the basically R in. So that's that bit here. Now the final part of the question says, show that the specific energy of a circular orbit of radius R in is minus eta C squared, where eta is 1 over 16. Okay, quite like this part of the question. So, the final part is basically, it's just this bit here. So, the specific energy at R in, and so what we've, what we've deduced from the previous part of the question was, orbits are unstable at R in equals 6 Rg. So, we're going to take R in is 6 Rg. We calculate the specific energy at this point, which is this part here. We can simplify this. We can rewrite Rg uh, you know, gm over rg as c squared, which is kind of just this section here and that here. And then we can therefore rewrite this quantity as minus eta c squared, where eta is 1 over 16. So yeah, I like, I like that. Okay, so that is question 1a. Let me know in the comments how you found that. I thought that was really nice. Um, obviously, in the exam, you need to remember certain quantities. If you don't, then this would be quite hard to you. Um, but yeah, it's essentially just remembering certain formulas and adding them in and you know, simplifying the maths. I think that was one thing with the exams I found at Cambridge was a lot a lot of the time it, you really needed to practice just being able to like simplify things and just having like really quick calculations because a lot of the time, you know, this, this in itself is what would take, you, you have to do this in 20 minutes. And when you then think about like having to calculate things um, yeah, it's it could it could be quite a lot. So Cambridge definitely taught me to just be very fast with my calculations because <laughs> I had to in the exam. On the topic of fast calculations, I'd like to say a big thank you to Brilliant for supporting this video. This video has covered a lot of mathematics around black holes, accretion of matter, a lot of underlying astrophysics and some pretty complex mathematics. So if you want a free and fun way to learn some prerequisite material to this exam or just generally expand your knowledge around STEM, you can do so on Brilliant with their various courses. Now, I'm sure most of you have already heard about Brilliant, but if you haven't, Brilliant is basically a website and an app that helps you learn new concepts in mathematics, science and technology. For example, they have a full astrophysics course that will give you important prerequisite knowledge to understanding parts of this exam, which include full lessons on black holes and understanding the behaviour behind them. There are also courses on classical mechanics, gravitational physics, quantum objects, to name a few. There are also lots of mathematics courses on there as well. One thing that I love so much about Brilliant is the interactivity of the lessons. Now, we all know that if you're studying for an exam and you're doing something like just watching lectures, that's not very efficient. It's actually been shown that interactive learning is six times more efficient than passive learning, like sitting in lectures. What's also great about the membership is that you can go at your own pace, you can go as fast or as slow as you like, and there's no pressure to compute the answers in some of the lessons. So if you are stuck on a question, you can just reveal the answer and find out the answer for yourself. It's just about enjoying the learning process and having fun learning something new. If you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Ellie Slytome or click the link in the description and the first 200 of you that do that will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So a huge thank you to Brilliant for supporting this video and for supporting my channel. Now let's get back to the exam. Obviously I said that this would take 20 minutes but this is 1A so it's obviously going to be easier than B and C. Um, so ideally you'd want to be doing this in less than 20 minutes which is, yeah, can be quite a lot. So the second part of the question says the following. The one dimensional evolutionary equations for an accretion disk are given as follows. So we have two equations here. So the curly M is the mass per unit radius. The curly F is the radial mass flux and the curly G, I don't know if these have specific names for if they're curly or not. So I apologize if I'm just saying curly and they actually do have a specific name. Um, but the curly G is the internal torque and it says, show that the solution for a steady accretion disk with accretion rate m dot and zero torque at r equals r in, in the potential considered in part a, has vertically integrated viscosity, given by this, where f is given by this, and x is denoted this. Okay, so this is the first part of the question. There's quite a lot to it. Now, the solution itself is 
this section here. Obviously, I have missed out a lot of the just calculating and the, the calculations. Um, the, if you're interested, you could, you could give it a go yourself. But I'll get in and show you uh, what you need to do. So the first thing in the equation, uh, in the, the question itself, um, it's very important. It mentions the solution for a steady accretion disk. So in fluid dynamics, what you know is if something is steady, essentially that just means that the differential with respect to t is always zero. So that means in this equation, where our equation two, or and equation one, these these t's essentially will, that goes to zero. Okay. With d by dt equals zero, what we can say is from the first equation, so this equation here, we know that df by dr equals zero. Okay. Now, obviously, with df by dr equals zero, we can say that f is therefore a constant. So if f equals a constant, then we know that r at r equals r in, which is what we've been given here. We know that the accretion rate is m, and therefore we have a minus because we have an accretion rate there. So that's given by that, and that's at r equals r in. So the first equation we find is f equals minus m dot. Now we can do the exact same thing with equation two and have a look at this. So we know that fh plus g must equal a constant. Okay, now we are given in the question that g in equals zero at r in, which essentially is at h in. Um, you can call the two uh, similar. Um, and then that reduces to this here. Now, what we can do is say, okay, well, we know what F is at R equals R in, it's M dot. So essentially just taking these two equations and, and solving them, um, given the condition that we have accretion rate M and zero torque, which is given by G at R equals R in. Okay, so yeah, we find, we find this equation here. Um, and again, that is literally just applying the boundary conditions, also applying the fact that we have f equals minus m dot. Um, yeah, and we find this. Now, the torque here is actually given by this in the lecture notes. So you need to remember this in the lecture notes, but essentially you just substitute g into here. You then obtain this equation here. Um, and then you just do some manipulation to get it into the form that, it, that it's needed. Um, we can basically just rewrite this equation as this uh, and we can then rewrite f uh, you know as follows here. And I'm obviously going to be skipping out all of those steps because it when I when I did this past paper it took me quite a while. So yeah I'm just going to be removing all these blue lines. But yeah that's essentially what you do. This is just this will just take some calculations here um, that you need. Um, and if you're interested, then give it a go yourself and, and have a go. But yeah, so that is the first part of the question answered. I realise that I'm taking a bit too long going through this, so I'm just going to try and speed up the process a little bit. Uh, and if you have any questions, just comment them down below and I'll do my best to answer. But the second part of the question then says, explain why a zero torque boundary condition is appropriate, R equals R in, and why the total luminosity of the steady accretion disk can be expected to be L disk, equals eta m dot c squared, where eta is the quantity calculated in part a, if the advection of heat into the black hole can be neglected. Whew, heavy. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just for the sake of the video, I'm going to just show you the answer here. This is the answer. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I, I realise this video is going to be very long otherwise. If Give it a read if you're interested in what the solution is, but I'll be moving on from that part of the question and just showing you certain aspects of it. So... If you have any questions on that part, let me know. Uh, but I'm going to be moving on to part 1C now. So we have a new part of the exam and it says the vertical structure of the disk in a steady state is governed by the equations. These are the following equations. I've labelled them for you just so you know what each of them represent. And it says where the symbols have their usual meanings. Assume that the opacity kappa and the ratio of radiation pressure to gas pressure, which are these quantities here, are independent of z, show that the effective viscosity rho nu is equal to this quantity where q is the orbital shear parameter. So this is the first part of the question. And this was actually quite simple really. Um, let me just check, did I get, yeah, it's literally just this section here. So what we can do is you can separate the pressure itself. So we, we were given the pressure, the total pressure here, but you can actually separate that into the parameter 
beta, which is the gas pressure, and then we have the radiation pressure as well. So you can write P equals B plus PR. So total B is gas pressure, radiation pressure. Okay. You can rewrite in terms of the radiation pressure, and then we can take these equations here. We can take the flux equation, which is this one, which we've written here, and you can solve for dp by dr, uh, and this is just basically noting that pr has this form here where it depends on t, um, I believe that's the correct, yep, yeah, pr, depends on t there, so you can essentially just look at what the radiation pressure is, uh, obtain dp by dr, and then from there you can then say, okay, well this is what f of z is. And then what we can do is we can look at the vertical hydrostatic balance, which is this equation here, which is dp by dz. And here we have dp by dz. But obviously we are told that beta gas pressure is gas pressure beta is independent of z. So therefore dp by dz is the same as dpr by dz. Um, okay, and then essentially you just substitute for the vertical hydrostatic balance. You obtain this quantity here. Um, and then using the equation for df by dz, input into here, do some rearranging, as you've seen here, and this is the equation that you get out of the end. So this is a really nice question. It's basically just using these uh, equations here um, and, yeah, finding a formula that, you're, that you are, you've been told to get. Um, I always really like these parts of the exam um, when it looked at basically vertical disk structure and the equations governing them. It felt a bit more like fluid dynamics. Um, not so much, I mean, it was just more a lot of like manipulation, but yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it. It was good. So yeah, there we go. There's the answer. Now, the final part of the question, which isn't long, which is great, says the Eddington luminosity, LE, and the Eddington accretion rate, M dot E, are defined by this equation here where eta is the quantity calculated in part A, show that the full vertical thickness of the steady accretion disk is given by this quantity here. Okay, now again, this is just this final part um, here, and all you need to know is that the vertical integrated viscosity is given by this equation here. You kind of have to assume that you have some length scale of this, um, of the disk itself. You can then say, okay, well, all of this together will equal this once we've inputted the value for new V, which is what we have. Uh, sorry, row new here, input that into there, do some manipulation, noting certain quantities. We can then essentially, I think, multiply each side by a certain quantity and you will eventually get to this solution here. Now, obviously, the main steps are given here, um, but it's essentially just know, knowing if you know what the vertical integrated viscosity is here and what the formula is for it, you can calculate the rest that you need to know. You just need to add some extra, like hints in um, for the reader to say, okay, this is how we're going to get there. Okay, cool. So that was question one. Um, and I've been talking for a while on this question now. Oh, I'm slightly out of breath. <laughs> it's taken me back to uh, sitting exams. Now that's taken me like 20 minutes just to explain. Um, and yeah, let alone writing at all. So yeah, I had one, one hour to do all of that. Um, minus all the thinking time. <laughs> so yeah. Editing Ellie here, I've decided to cut this video a little bit short. So essentially I had answered the entire paper, uh, the entire three questions, and it had taken me just under two hours to do, and I didn't want to make an entire video for two hours of me going through an entire past paper. Of course, if that's something you want to see, then let me know and I well, will make that video. But I've just decided to crop it short at the first question on this past paper. The reason for doing that is because the first, paper, the first question was a lot easier than the second and third question. So hopefully those of you that have watched this far understand what's happened. And hopefully without any background knowledge, you know about the maths roughly. Hopefully you've been able to follow along quite well. This question was probably the easiest question out of all of the past papers. So hopefully it was nice enough for you to understand. I understand that the title of this video is it is a past paper from one of the hardest maths courses in the world. So this question may not reflect the intensity of the course and how hard the questions usually are, but I decided to set quite a simple question just so then you can understand hopefully what the maths was behind this. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm sorry for cutting the video short, but if you do want to see the other questions, number two and number three, then let me know um, and I will provide the solution to those or I'll make a video on it. So yeah, just let me know. But I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please like, subscribe and comment. Let me know any video suggestions you want to see. 
and I'll see you all in the next one.